Hello and welcome to Voice of the Province. I'm your host, Troy Glover. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about pretty much a four-party rumble in the province of New Brunswick after the election. And to talk with us tonight, we have Chris Austin, leader of the People's Alliance New Brunswick. Thanks for joining us Good tonight, Be here, Chris. Troy. Thank you. Now, first let's talk a bit about the election. Now, were you surprised like, that you ended with winning three seats? Like, Was it a surprise to you at all? Uh, I mean, it was it was a it was a good thing. Uh, we were excited. Um, surprised? I don't know how I'd put surprised. We 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 kind of sensed that, you know, we were getting a lot of momentum on the ground. Um, you know, we talked to people in the street, kind of the coffee shop talk. We we knew we were getting getting traction. Um, I was surprised at kind of the the results, the makeup overall, with you know the the Liberals twenty one, PCs twenty two, and us and the Greens with three each so it was uh, it was definitely a historic election exciting now your party's popularity seemed to surge in the last couple of weeks of the campaign now what do you think flipped voter opinion for your party I you know to be honest I don't know if it was necessarily a flip of voter opinion I think it was more the undecided um, there was well people that would I guess in the polls declare undecided before that I think there was a lot more people that had their minds made up um, that's why I've always said I, I don't put a lot of faith in polls because people oftentimes will, for whatever reason, they won't give an honest answer or they'll try to deflect or something in, in the poll. Um, so, I, you know, I, I just, if you look at the polls leading up to the election, there was a lot of inaccuracies to what we have today, uh, obviously. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, think, uh, I think most people's minds were made up, and I think when they got the call from the polling company, you know, most people just choose to say one thing or another and then vote the way they originally intended. But I... Now, a lot of your candidates seem to have very respectable um, voter showings in certain writings that you, your party didn't win. Now, do you think the Liberals and Conservatives took notice of that? Well, I'm sure they have. Yeah, no question. Um, and I think it's, it's important to realize, too, that what we've seen in this last election really was, you know, New Brunswickers were just tired of the status quo. They, they're, they're tired of this this back and forth red and blue, and uh, they wanted what uh, I, I think what we have today in the makeup of the legislature. They want some different voices in there. They want uh, some different ideas. They they want to see the two parties getting sh you know shook up, which is exactly what's happening. And I'll tell you the benefit of all of this, Troy, is the fact that. You know, I, I mean, I, I'm obviously new to the legislature in terms of being an elected MLA, but I'm not new to politics. I've been in this for quite a while, so I, I have some understanding of how the process works. And what I've found being elected is, you know, is, is, is how this is going to open the doors in so many ways. It's going to create a, a better accountable government going forward because what we're going to do in the next little bit is we're going to change the process by which the legislature operates in terms of committees and, and, and policies and other, uh, other important items. So I'm, I'm very happy because this is going to be good for New Brunswick in the end. Uh, we do have to get that stability, uh, but uh, that will come shortly. And I think once the stability is there in government, I think we're going to see uh, the doors of the legislature open up, which is really good. Now, during this campaign, your party seemed to very effectively use social media as a way to kind of take control of the media and like how, how people are viewing you and just getting your message out there. Now, how big of a role did you think this engagement on social media really played in, during your, like in your campaign? Huge. Definitely huge. Um, you know, it's kind of funny because, you know, the eight years, you know, when we started in 2010 and we ran in the first two elections and even up to this third one, we kind of spent a lot of time chasing the media around, you know, trying to get our message out, trying to use mainstream media, you know, to drive it home. Uh, now it's like the other way around. It's like the media is chasing us for the comments. So, social media has has played uh, a great part. I mean, it, it it it's a way to get the raw, unfiltered, unedited, unedited messages right to the people. And that's why, like, even what we're doing here tonight. I mean, this is a live broadcast. Uh, there's no editing involved. It's you ask the questions, we have a discussion. People call in, ask questions, and I think that's what people want. They want, you know, just no uh, scripted views, no, uh, you know, backroom writing what to say and how to answer. It's just raw and unfiltered. I, I think it's good. All right, excellent. Uh, okay, so we're going to go to the lines for a second now. We have uh, on the line Donald from St. John. Hello, Donald. How are you doing? Hello. Oh, I want to congratulate you on your uh, win. Thank you, Donald. I appreciate that. 
Finally, somebody got in there to do something. We're, we're certainly going to work hard. Um, you know, I can tell you that I've committed as uh, my caucus. Uh, the three of us, we've said, look, we're going to do whatever it takes. To I voted most of my life. And the time Rover Show was taking power until now. And on the, in the last election, I, I, I just seen one bunch of thieves going in one door and another bunch going out the back door. And it just seemed like a waste of time voting until you came along. Well, thank you. I, I, I truly appreciate that. We'll, we'll certainly work hard and do our best. So keep up your good work, and I know you win. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donald, for calling in. <clears throat> now, going back to social media, like as we have sometimes with social media, it's like it's hard to it's hard to say what's true, what's what's false. It, it kind of gets lost in a wall sometimes. Mm -hmm. Now, you, there was some pushback you got from uh, from people online that perceived your party as anti francophone anti-immigrant. Uh, and even dangerous to the province. Now, do you think you were able to effectively temper that critical role that your party was perceived on social media? Yeah, and I think, you know, when you talk about media in general, I mean, frankly, you can look at uh, some of the mainstream media headlines over the last little bit, and you can see the same amount of fear-mongering and sensationalism that goes along with it. Um, people aren't stupid. They, they, they see it for what it is. Um, you know, it's a way to sell a paper or grab a headline. Uh, but most people know, uh, you know, that there's more to it than, than a headline. And again, that's why we like social media and, and we've used it uh, quite aggressively because, again, it just it gets our message out pure and unfiltered. It's, it's what we've been saying. And in terms of, you know, what, what people are saying on our, what, what they perceive our views to be, or uh, there's a lot of political interference that would be played in that, of course. The other parties want to try to, you know, uh, paint us as a certain way. Um, and we just simply refuse to, to give in to that. Our message has been clear, it's been concise. Uh, we support the rights of both linguistic communities. Uh, in terms of immigration, I mean, I've never said anything detrimental to, to immigration. I mean, but, you know, the only thing I have said is I think it's important that we give New Brunswickers an opportunity to be trained and, and to get the, the, the jobs that they need. Uh, but that doesn't exclude closing doors to skilled workers coming in from other countries to, to help fill the gap. We've always said that. That hasn't changed in our, in our policies or ideas. So, you know, I mean, people can, uh, you know, use politics and fear-mongering to, to try to get an outcome. But uh, I, I tell you, media as a whole doesn't have the same effect it had, say, 20 years ago. Um, people, are, people are wiser to, to how things unfold today and to the truth that, that lays before them. And they're not so easily persuaded um, with, with all the fear-mongering. Now... Going online as well, like from people calling your party this and that, like some people have even gone as far to compare you to compare the People's Alliance realistically to say Donald Trump or Doug, Doug Ford. What do you feel about this kind of comparison? Uh, they can have at it, I guess. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, you know, I mean, you look at a guy like Donald Trump, I mean, the President of the United States. Um, look, the guy said some crazy things. Um, you just look at his Twitter feed, it's, it's been, you know, some, some wild things that's come out of his, his, uh, his fingers or his mouth, however you want to say it. But uh, at the same time, you can look at the United States as a whole, and they've had some very significant numbers in their economy, and uh, their jobless rate, I think, is one of the lowest in decades. Uh, so they've had some significant improvement in their country down there. Now, on the flip side, uh, it, it hasn't always worked so well for Canada, you know, on a federal level. And uh, I think what we need here at home is people that will stand up for Canadians and, and fight tough, uh, if need be, to, to make sure that Canada gets what it needs. And, and the same goes for the province of New Brunswick. I mean, you know, um, New Brunswick is a small province in, in the scale of, of the nation. So we need leaders here at home that, that will stand up and fight and, and uh, you know, really, really work hard for the people here. Now, was this the nastiest New Brunswick election you think you've seen? Oh, I don't think so. Um, you know, I, I mean, I know, you know, you've got the typical red and blue back and forth with, with the attack ads and all that sort of thing. We, we, we chose not to play that. I know we were, we were I call it the victims of some of those attacks. I know locally uh, there was some, you know, information going out that, uh, you know, tried to attract, attack me as a candidate and, and some of our other candidates. but. 
we, you know what, we just stayed the course. We just kept saying what we uh, were meaning and, uh, and let the chips fall where they may. Now, for many years in the province, like that people have seen, everyone's had this conception that voting for anyone other than PC or Liberal is essentially wasting your vote. Um, now, with David Kuhn winning in 2014 and now five more non-traditional MLAs now uh, residing in the legislature, do you think that perception has been changed? I think that perception has been shattered. I think uh, we are in a new era of politics and I can tell you uh, that since the night of the election to where we are at today, approximately you know four weeks after, um, our, our membership has increased dramatically our support has increased dramatically and I think it's because people and I'm even I'm even hearing from people today that are saying that you know I mean it's, it's somewhat humorous but they'll say you know I didn't vote for you last election you know this this recent election uh, but man will I ever vote for you next time you know it's because they felt they you know and some people bought into that very thing you know you split the vote or you vote for a non-traditional party they won't be able to do anything and here we are in a minority situation where the two smallest parties hold the balance of power so and and, and this and, and and I you know I have to say that what we're seeing today is what I've been saying for months and even years is that a minority government is, is can be a great thing for New Brunswick and and having smaller parties in there is what is needed in this province to shake it up and and to get some ideas out there that the two parties won't talk about or that they'll avoid so we're here to say look um, we're not going to you know play this politically correct game that we've seen in in politics for too long we're going to be respectful uh, but we got to be able to talk about things that are important to New Brunswickers things that, that involve fiscal responsibility social responsibility uh, whatever it is I mean let's talk about it and, and uh, have open debate now for many years New Brunswick's been a two-party province pretty much now with this election passing by do you think that that's now signaling the end of this two-party structure now we're gonna see much more representation future elections of th uh, third parties yeah absolutely and I'll tell you it's all about um, one, once once you kind of break the dam it's like the dam opens wide up mm -hmm. uh, just a crack will do it and you even look at like one-term governments uh, you can look back uh, you know several elections ago where we had the first one-term government we never seen that before and then it was a one-term government mm -hmm. and then another one-term government so it's New Brunswickers shaking themselves of the traditional way of doing things and the way of doing politics and saying look we got a fourteen and a half billion dollar debt uh, the spending's been out of control over the last decade uh, health care is in serious trouble um, all across the board you, you pick your, your topic and there's some real challenges and we need to think differently to get out of this so I'm I'm very humbled and excited that New Brunswick put their faith in in us uh, to help be a voice to to work at getting this straightened out now during the last year of the election, you were actually excluded from the CTV roundtable debate. Now, do you think this might have this snub like galvanized your supporters? Yeah, that, that's what I find interesting, um, and and it was frustrating, very mm -hmm. frustrating to be on the outside looking in. Um, but I will tell you that when those things happen, when we're either marginalized, excluded, attacked, especially unnecessarily. I mean, look, if we say something or we do something, if we drop the ball and we get some flack for it, that's fair. And, and we need to own that and, and correct it and do better going forward. I, I've always said that. And we've not always done things perfectly. I, I know that. But when you get attacked for things that are just fear-mongering or you try to be marginalized, you're not included in, in certain things, absolutely galvanize us, our support. It, 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 it takes the people that we have and it gives them a greater resolve to, to push forward. And it's gets people on the outside that are kind of sitting on the fence watching saying uh, you know I think these guys have something that's real here and and, uh, and, and it, it grows our support now as more now as we go forward now with more third parties may uh, possibly getting more seats in the uh, legislature for New Brunswick do you think this will kind of sway uh, uh, sway the media and make them have to reevaluate evaluate how they represent uh, third parties in the province afterwards well, yes, and I can tell you since the election, I've probably done more media, more mainstream media interviews since the election than I've done in the last four years combined. Um, so absolutely, um, they can't ignore us anymore. And, and nobody can ignore 
the dynamics of what happened on September the 24th. I mean, this is truly a historic moment for New Brunswick. It's an opportunity that uh, New Brunswick hasn't seen in over 100 years. And uh, look, I'm just excited and uh, proud to be part of it. You know, but you know, it's, it's got to get to a place where, we, again, we get that stability in government and where we can uh, start getting things done, start, start working. Now, for the first time in a very long time, New Brunswick is heading into a new legislative session with an incredible amount of uncertainty, actually. Um, do you think that the anxiety of, that New Brunswickers are feeling right now is perfectly justified? Uh, <clears throat> I think a lot of it is, again, getting back to the mainstream media. It's, it's interesting because when I look at it, and being in politics for a lo as long as I have, while this is unique to New Brunswick, this is not unique as a whole. I mean, minority governments have functioned all across the world, and including Canada, and, and, and has done, have done very well. So the sky is not falling. Government is not uh, uh, in a frenzy and chaotic. No, we're, we're, we, we've got a momentary uh, pause here since the election. Uh, but the day is going to come soon enough uh, where we are going to have that stability. And, uh, um, you know, I, again, I, I, think, I think a little bit is, is kind of blown out of proportion by mainstream media, and I think people just read the headlines and, and they, you know, get themselves in a little bit of a frenzy maybe at times. But if you step back and you look at it objectively, um, you know, this, this is not completely new, new to New Brunswick, but it's not new in, in, a, in a, you know, wide scale. Uh, now, both the People's Alliance and Green Party are coming in with three members each, the legislature. <clears throat> um, what do you think this new diverse like membership will do like politically for the province this time around? It'll do some great things. Uh, I had a good discussion earlier today with David Kuhn, you know, to talk about committees and how they're structured, to talk about, excuse me, uh, third party budgets. Um, you know, when you have a majority government, as we've had in the past, and if you have that one seat, whether it's the NDP or the Green, um, you know, that one seat and the opposition don't... Okay, I'm sorry, I have to cut you off here right now. Oh, sure. We have to go off to break. Uh, we're going to go off to a short break. Uh, please stay with us as we continue to talk to Chris Austin about basically problems concerning the problems after the election. <laughs> Back to Voice of the Province. I'm your host, Troy Glover. Tonight we're talking about basically a four-party rumble after the election for New Brunswick. And in with us we have Chris Austin, leader of the People's Alliance for New Brunswick. Um, before I cut you off for, uh, for going over into a commercial break, uh, did you want to continue on what you were saying before? I kind of forget what the question was. <laughs> uh, we, were, we were talking about how, uh, uh, how with now Green Party has three members and you also have three members in legislature, how much of a diverse like political setting yeah, are we seeing here? Yeah, okay, right. So we, we were talking, um, I was talking to David Kuhn earlier, we were talking about like committees yeah. and the process of committees and that sort of thing. And I, I think the difference is, is, is in a minority government, um, you know, it's actually the opposition uh, all together, all three parties, whoever that may be in the opposition, can kind of control how that system works. And uh, which is, again, it's good because when you have a majority government, one party ultimately kind of controls committees, controls, you know, the whole function of everything. And when that happens, you have a lot less accountability. Whereas now, that's not the case. Uh, so it's going to open the doors of, of information, um, uh, you know, again, accountability where no one party kind of calls the shots. Now it's, you know, we, we have to work together and we, we hold each other accountable. So at the end, I think it's going to be great for New Brunswickers. Now, what message do you think New Brunswick, this New Brunswick election, uh, like, has given or has sent to Brian Gallant with now the six non traditional uh, party members in the legislature? Well, I, I think it sent a message not just to Mr. Gallant, but I think to the two parties as a whole. Um, and, and that is that they, they have to do things differently. And, uh, and this, isn't, uh, th this isn't the way, you know, politics was done 30 years ago. This is a new era, and people, people have a, a higher expectation of what they uh, want, want to see from government and their elected officials. So, you know, 
Whether they got the message, I, I don't know. Um, time will tell that, but I can tell you the difference is, is we're here to hold their feet to the fire. Whether it's Liberal government or Conservative government, frankly, I could, you know, n n neither way to me. Uh, I'm just looking forward to being able to, to get our voice in there uh, to get things done and hold whatever go government is in power uh, truly accountable. Now, you and your elected members are going to be sworn in, I believe, is tomorrow yes. uh, to be to be officially a part of New Brunswick legislation. And what's going through your mind right now with that? Uh, well, I'll tell you. I mean, it's exciting. You know, we're 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 very excited about it. This is this is again a historic election, and to be part of that is, uh, yeah, it's 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 pretty exciting. We've worked long and hard for this, and and I, I got to say, you know, we we've been at this since 2010. Um, I certainly didn't do this on my own by any stretch. Uh, we're talking, and I didn't have the money to pay staff. I had a lot of volunteers. I had a lot of passionate people that were fed up with the two parties and realized just sitting back and watching isn't going to get anything done. They jumped on. They worked hard, uh, sweat, blood, and tears, and uh, got us to where we're at today. So it was definitely a team approach, and I'm proud of the team. Excellent. Uh, we're going to go to the lines here for a second. We have Claude from Mary Machine. Hello, Claude. Hi. Hi. Hi, Chris. I just wanted to congratulate you and say thank you for being there for us. And uh, many trips to the Mare Machine around the province seems to have paid off. Uh, as you're aware, PAMB got more votes here on the Mare Machine than any other party. And uh, I just want to again say thank you, and, and I know you will stay focused. So thanks again. Yep. Thank, thank you, Claude. And I tell you, the Miramichi, I always call it kind of my second home. We spent a lot of time in the Miramichi, and uh, those people are, are great up there. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get uh, Michelle Conroy uh, elected in Miramichi Center, and, and she had, an, uh, I'll tell you, the team in Miramichi was unbelievable. I mean, they had such a well-oiled machine up there. And, uh, you know, to take out, uh, uh, you know, a, a minister and a veteran politician uh, like Bill Frazier. Bill's a good guy. I, I like Bill. Um, but again, it was just part of that, that old structure that had to go. And uh, for Michelle, who's this, you know, somewhat newbie to, to politics, but, but genuine, sincere, smart, articulate, uh, she came in there with a, with a great team and pulled it off. And then you even look at, uh, you know, the other writings. You know, Terry Collette ran for us. Uh, Art O'Donnell, Art come with, within 30-some votes of, of winning. So uh, Mayor Machine is great. They, they did a great job up there and, uh, and did us all proud. Right. Thank you, Claude, for call, calling in. Um, now, your party was created nearly a decade ago. Um, did you did you see this uh, this coming around? Like, did you see your party actually making headway like this as a uh, if situation or a when situation? Um, <clears throat> I can tell you when we started in 2010. Uh, I'll be honest, we were a little naive. Uh, well, I knew back then that people, even eight years ago. They were, they were tired of the two-party system. Nobody was really happy. I mean, you could even talk to strong liberals or strong conservatives, and, and they kind of plugged their nose and they went to the ballot box. But nobody was really happy or excited about the two parties. I was a little naive in to think that that lack of excitement or passion would formulate into votes for, you know, for us to be able to, to get in there and, and wedge in between the two. Well, that obviously didn't happen in 2010. 2014 was much closer, which gave us you know, the wind in our sails to carry forward into 2018 where we finally have seen success. And I, I truly believe that if, if we continue to do what, you know, we've said we're going to do and continue to fight for the people of New Brunswick, that support will only grow as we go forward. So I'm excited for now. I'm really excited for what's going to happen down the road. Now, since election night, there's been a lot of jockeying of the four <laughs> parties, like just trying to figure out how they were going, uh, how they're going to fix up a strategy going into this session. How, i got to say, how often do you think your phone was ringing? <laughs> it's been ringing. It's been ringing <laughs> steady, I can tell you. Um, and, and it's not a bad thing. I, you know, I, I, don't, like, I don't like the floor crossing uh, that, that is, is being pitched. I, I don't agree with that. I think, you know what, like you were elected and whatever color you ran on, uh, you need to stay there uh, until the next election. Um, but I do understand, you know, whether it's liberals or conservatives trying to vie for votes to get that majority. I mean, that's that's the way it's supposed to work. So I I, I get that, and uh, yeah, there's been a lot of a lot of phone calls and and uh, discussions, you know, to to make government work. 
Now, were any of uh, your elected MLAs targeted for an attempt to uh, flip parties? Um, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. Um, I haven't been because I know they'd be wasting their time with me and frankly I think they'd be wasting their time with our caucus because we have a very strong team. Uh, Michelle and uh, Rick are dedicated to, to what we've been doing and uh, they're not going to budge. So I, I don't know, I mean I, I talked to them and, and Rick and Michelle and they haven't given me any indication that, that they have been approached in that capacity. Now in terms of being a speaker or voting in, in, in line with the current government, of course, yes, that's been, but there's no secret to that. That's, they've been doing that with everybody, uh, but we've been declining those as well. Now, have you and David Kuhn had a chance to talk <laughs> about what your two parties might be Excuse able me. to accomplish this, uh, for this coming session, like within holding basically six seats between both your parties? Yep. Uh, yeah, I did have a conversation today with David, uh, Mr. Kuhn, uh, you know, concerning, you know, again, the committee work and the budgets for the parties and to make sure that, you know, we have enough resources to be able to operate. Um, and I think we can come to some agreement on that. I think we can work together on that. Um, you know, but I think it's, it, it is bigger than just us and, and the Greens. I think, you know, obviously you need 25 seats for a majority. So I think uh, the PCs are going to play a big part in that after next year, next week, um, you know, to determine uh, how things move forward. Now, your party came out very early in saying that it would support the Higgs government on a bill-by-bill -bill basis. Um, now, would you say it was important for your party to come out uh, fairly quickly, spell out what plans you would have with the Higgs government? Yeah, and, and we wanted to, that's why we were first out of the gate. Mm -hmm. I wasted no time. Uh, as soon as we seen the results of the election, we realized how things were going to shake up. I wanted to make sure that our supporters knew where we stood, but also that other New Brunswickers knew where we stood. Um, I've said all along, you know, we're not in this to be in anybody's back pocket. We want to have our independent voice. But in minority government situations, you, you have to negotiate. I mean, it, it's all about you give in some areas, you take in others. That's why minor, minority governments can be so great and, and work so well. Um, and, and we've said, you know, we, we said from day one we'd work with any party. The, some of the other parties closed the door on that immediately. Uh, which is fine, that's their right to do, uh, but the party that didn't would, would be the PCs. So we're, we said, look, we're, we're willing to work with, with them on a bill-by-bill -bill basis and uh, create that stability in government. All right, uh, we're going to go to the lines. We have someone on the lines already waiting for us. So we have Gitan from Grand Big. Hello. 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 Hello, how are you? Fine. You have, uh, I'm listening to you, and uh, you have uh, some very interesting uh, comments and thoughts about politics in New Brunswick. Uh, I have just one question. Uh, will you also fight for francophones? Absolutely, without question. How? Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, okay. The paramedic issue. Uh, some, some, of the, some of the biggest issues with paramedic crisis is happening in francophone areas. And we fought very hard to say whether it's, say, say Canton uh, or, or any other area, rural area in New Brunswick, that the response times for paramedics got to be got to be better. I mean, people can't be waiting 40, 50 minutes for an ambulance to show up. That's ridiculous. And we have championed that long before the papers or anybody was even talking about ambulance response times. Two years ago, we, we wrote commentaries on it. We said, this is an issue. Finally, we're seeing it where all the parties are, are saying it's an issue. So, and in terms of, of, of francophones specifically, uh, you know, we, we've talked about, for example, language with, with the paramedics. And, yeah, yeah. And, and, right, people interpret that and they say, well, you know, uh, that means that only English only paramedics would be hired. And what I am saying is no. If you have a francophone paramedic in, in the north or in a, in, a, in a demographic where there's a high francophone population or a francophone region, the francophone paramedic that doesn't speak very good English should get the job. If, if, if he or she is working in a francophone region, it only makes sense that that francophone should get the job. They shouldn't be denied the job. No more than the anglophone that's working in a predominantly anglophone region should be denied a job because they don't speak French. So Okay, okay but, yeah. but then let's, let's see in a 100% in a francophone area, um, uh, the, the uh, ambulance ambulance comes and uh, they cannot express themselves in English, what happens? 
Yeah, good, good question. So when you call 911, you have bilingual operators. That's standard, and, and we understand that. There's no question there. Uh, so a lot of the triage or the information is going to be done over the phone before the paramedic ever arrives. They already know either through the, vic the patient or those around the patient, family members, friends, or you know, people, bystanders, whatever it is, are, are going to give the information to the 911 dis dispatcher, whether it's in French or English or any language for that matter. Mm -hmm. So that information is already being received by the paramedics en route to the call. So when the paramedics arrive, um, if there's a language barrier, then we have dedicated translation lines in the ambulance. It's, it's, it's like a walking or a mobile... A translation line? Yes, in every single ambulance, as well as, and you wouldn't need it, but translation technology. So there's, there's other options there. Uh, because what's happening is, because of language, paramedics are not getting permanent full-time employment, which means Ambulance New Brunswick is, is struggling to retain paramedics that they currently have, which is causing these big wait times in places like St. Catan. So we, we want to bring a more practical approach to it, look at our demographics, see where the numbers warrant it, and make sure that, the, and, and again, we're not denying anybody's service. Everybody's going to be served, whether you live in St. St. Catan or whether you live in St. Stephen. And whether you're French or English, you're still going to get the service. Um, nobody's going to be denied that. But there's a more practical way to do it. Yeah, but the, the only thing I, 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 can't, I don't understand is how the, uh, this translation is done. Well, there, there's two methods. Again, there's the 911 call, the ori original call. Yeah. So if you're a francophone, and say you're in St. Stephen, you're a francophone in St. Stephen, and you require uh, a paramedic, you, you're in an emergency situation. Yeah, that's 911. But once yeah. the ambulance is there, mm -hmm. okay, uh, and uh, let's say, uh, let's say in, uh, um, in, uh, in the French area, there's somebody, uh, unilingual English, okay. uh, anglophone, Mm -hmm. And the uh, the two paramedics are unilingual francophone. Right. What what happens? Okay. So again, those two unilingual francophones would already have the information, most of the information, not all the information, on the situation of that unilingual anglophone. Okay. Um, when the paramedics arrive, and, and okay, let's say they don't speak good English. Uh, there would still be, if they had to, there would still be a translation line. So there would be uh, no different than a, a speaker phone that, that would be available in the ambulance. Uh, how, does that, how, that, how does that work, the translation line? It, it's a person. Uh, it's an actual person that would be able to translate. Um, it, uh -huh. it's, it's no different than what they do in the legislature. You know, in the legislature, there's some that, that you know, mm -hmm. they can't speak both languages. So there's a, there's a translator that translates in real time. Uh, as the situation unfolds in the legislature, it'd be no different than uh, than what 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 could happen uh, in in paramedics. But again, we, we uh, what I want to stress: these would be extremely rare cases in predominantly language areas, one way or the other. If you're talking where there's a 50-50, like Moncton, uh, of course you're going to need bilingual paramedics. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but in predominant areas where there's predominant language one way or the other, even the arbitrator said it's, it's, it's hurting everybody by having these unnecessary language requirements. And it's causing these huge wait times because we don't have enough paramedics to retain because they're leaving the province or they're going into other fields because of language in many of them. So mm -hmm. we, we, we're not, again, we're not here to take anybody's rights away, but we've got to do this better. And we've got to do it in the way that everybody still gets their service. Um, but that we can keep the paramedics that we have. Okay, thank you. And uh, by the way, I, I like uh, your, um, your 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 thoughts and your comments about politics. Well, thank you, ma'am. And, and I, I want to add this, if I can. Um, it's 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 everyday francophones like yourself, ma'am, that that I think is so important to this conversation because. If we're honest with ourselves, there's some very extreme views on one side and there's some very extreme views on the other. Uh, what I want to do is have a seat in the middle and I want to hear from both sides and I want to make this work. We can make this work. Um, New Brunswickers get along. It doesn't matter if you're Francophone or Anglophone. We're one province, we're one people, but we just got to do it better. Thank you. Uh, 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 no, a last question. Mm -hmm. Are you learning French? <laughs> I, <yeah. laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> 
I, I took it in school. Um, it kind of I did some missions work in Haiti for a short, very short period, and of course Haiti's a, a French uh, country, so a little bit of a come out from time to time. But I can tell you that I am going to be working on that as an MLA and as a leader of the party going forward. There's more resources that'll be available to me to be able to, to at least try to learn uh, French. And uh, I, I look, I, I think it's great to learn two languages. I've always said that, uh, and, and I'm going to do my best to, to do that. All right. Uh, unfortunately, we have to cut off now for uh, for commercial break. Um, continue with, uh, with us as we continue to talk about uh, basically problems concerning the province after the current election. the province. I'm your host Troy Glover. Tonight we're talking about basically a four-party rumble in the province of New Brunswick after the uh, recent election. And tonight we have talking with us Chris Austin, leader of the People's Alliance of New Brunswick. Um, going right off the bat, we're going to go right to the calls. We have one lined up already. We have Sonny from Dalhousie Junction. Hello, Sonny. Hi, how are you? Good. Hi, Sonny. Hi, Chris. How are you? Good. How are you? Uh, pretty good, Chris. My question is, we're roughly about 800,000 people in the province of New Brunswick. And when I grew up uh, as a kid and I went to school, it was all French and English, and it was great. Some of my best friends today are French. And when I see all what's going on and the people leaving our country, uh, our province over this year's situation, it don't make sense. With the technology we have today, is there a way that we can go back to what Louis J. Rubichaud wanted? Louis J. Rubichaud made it very clear that nobody should be able to, can't get a job or whatever because of a language barrier. When people, kids grow up together, why did it ever get this far? Why did the politicians play politics with all of this instead of doing it the right way? Yeah, great question. And, and I think, Sonny, to be honest, I think over the years, um, again, it gets to extreme views, right? You have certain extreme groups that will push and push and push one way or the other. And, you know, I think it's important to step back from these extreme views and, and to look at things in a practical, um, you know, a practical way. Um, and, you know, when I think about bilingualism, you know, be, before bilingualism was implemented, if you were a unilingual francophone, um, frankly, you, you were at a disadvantage, you know, when it came to government services, when it came to the courts, when it came to whatever. Uh, you know, you, you may have been 30 percent of the population, but you couldn't get service. Um, that was wrong. I, I'll be the first to say it. it's not right. Um, so, you know, if, if we're going to look at the true intent, bilingualism implement, when, when Louis J. Robichaud implemented bilingualism, you know, he, he, he emphatically stated when he presented the bill that this would not put any unilingual at a disadvantage for government employment. Right? So all other things being, being uh, equal. Uh, so if, if we just go with what he said, his intention was that this would not discriminate based on language. And yet here we are today, and we can clearly see on both fronts that language is becoming a discriminatory barrier for people getting employment in government. And I don't think we need to do that. I think what we need to do is we need to look at, at different options. Um, again, and, and I was so glad to hear from Gaetan here a, a moment ago and, and uh, you know, asking those tough questions. They're valid questions. But there's valid answers, and, and I think when we look across the board of government departments, there are answers to these, these tough questions where we don't have to have bilingual staff across the board. And that goes for francophones as well. If you're a unilingual francophone and you're working in a predominantly francophone area, you deserve employment just as much as a unilingual anglophone working in predominantly anglophone areas. So we've got to put some common sense to this, some balance, and, uh, and to make it work. 
that we're running into with all of this, Chris, is that we're only roughly between 750 and 800,000 people. If we're going to keep going with the infrastructure we got in place today, who's going to pay for all of this? I worked in a pulp mill for 30-some years. A lot of French people, a lot of English people. We never had a problem. Mm -hmm. We were always able to communicate and all got along great. Yep. But the problem that I see with all of this today, and I'll just use the school bus issue, you got a community where I live. you got 15, 16 kids that play together every day. They love each other, those little kids. Uh, when they go to school in the morning, three or four gets on an English bus, eight or nine gets on a French bus. What are we doing to our kids? Yeah. What kind of message are we sending them? If we want our kids to grow up and live in a picturesque province like that, how are we going to survive if we don't fix this mechanism? Mm -hmm. and, and that's pretty well the last question I have. But I, I'm wondering if the other parties will try to understand. You don't want to hurt anybody over this. All you want to do is use common sense and make it better. Yeah. So if you could, Chris, I would appreciate an answer on this. Yeah. No, and that's a valid point. And, and uh, you know, I, I've used this before, but I will say it again. I don't want to be redundant. but. You know, I, I grew up in a small community, Minto, and I love Minto. I, you know, it's, 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 it's got a real heart and soul. Minto come out of the coal mines, and part of the coal mines, you had all kinds of different ethnic groups, languages, cultures, uh, German, French, English, Dutch, Italian, which are still there today. You know, they, they've grown, and in, in, in the families have grown, and they're, they're you know, very much uh, the, the, the backbone of the community. And I can tell you, growing up as a child and hearing the stories of the coal mines, there was never this animosity based on language or culture. Uh, you want to talk about what multiculturalism looks like, come to Minto. Uh, you know, and, and government, nobody needed the government to come in and tell them what language to speak or dictate to them uh, how, how they're to roll out cultural policies and this sort of thing. People got along. They worked together. And uh, we need some more of that, I think, today. And I think we need government to just look at things practically. And uh, the school bus thing, I mean, we've said many times before, I don't think there's another jurisdiction in the civilized world that wouldn't allow to, uh, children to travel on the same school bus uh, based on language. It's just, it's so, it's so beyond my, my comprehension. Um, I, I don't know. It's, but, but we're, you know, again, we'll do what we can do in the situation that we have ourselves in as a minority government. Thank you, Sonny, for calling in. Uh, next on the line, we have Jason from Petticodiac. Hello, Jason. Hello, how are you doing? Good. Hi, Jason. Good. Good. So, Chris, much has been made about the bilingualism and that you're anti-bilingual, and I've actually followed your party since it first came in, and I do understand your platform in that. I'm just wondering, like, do you have a rebuttal for like the simple, oh, you're, you're bigots and you're anti-bilingual? I'd like to hear your perspective on that before I have my other questions. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, all I can say is I'm not. People that know me know I'm not uh, anti, you know, bilingual. Um, and if you look at our policies, at the very center of our policies, you know, we say that. We, we support uh, the right of French and English citizens to receive service in their language of choice. We've never backed away from that, from 2010 to where we're at today. What we had the issue with is how it's implemented. It's one thing to say you, 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 you disagree with something, uh, but that disagreement is based on the implementation of, of a policy or a law, not on the law itself. And, and that's what I continue to stress. The frustration comes in is when you have other parties that will try to paint you into a corner and the media will follow that. And, and, and because again, it's a sensationalism. It creates a nice headline on the front page. So you've got all these extreme groups, then you get them all fired up, and they're writing letters, and they're talking about court injunctions and all these other things. Uh, look, <laughs> our policies haven't changed. We've been saying the same thing since day one. We support the right of both linguistic communities. Uh, we don't support duality, 
and uh, we do not uh, support uh, you know, some of the ways bilingualism is being implemented. I completely agree, and I, I agree with you. The, it's the big difference between duality and, bi and bilingualism. Yes. I think it, there's a fine line, and a lot of people don't understand. Myself, as English only, my family is English only, I have no issues if an ambulance attendant comes and they cannot speak the language. I don't care if they can speak German, Chinese, doesn't matter to me if they can help me get me to the hospital. Like you said, when I call 911 or my wife does, all the information is going to be relayed. Really, they're just going to be checking me out, stabilizing me. I might not even be conscious. So language I don't find is that big of a barrier coming from English only. I don't, doesn't matter to me if they're francophone only, that there. As long as somebody shows up, that's the main thing is the way I see the whole ambulance situation. Yep. My biggest question, though, is when the House does sit, Hopefully we do get a speaker in and everything starts to go. I'm wondering, how quickly are you going to start pushing the stop spraying? Because that's one of the biggest concerns a lot of us have in this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and our platform, you know, was, was strong on that. We, we called for an end of glyphosate spraying on Crown land. Um, you know, the, the reality is, when you take our platform and you, you lay out all the things that we've called for, uh, none of that has changed. However, there is a reality that we are in a minority situation. So it, it's kind of like one of those things where you have to pick your battles and you have to say, if you know, we may want to take it to a 10, but in a minority situation, you might only get to a six, but at least you're not a zero anymore. And you know what I mean in terms of specific policies and fighting for specific policies. So, you know, that's going to be the careful dance that has to happen in a minority situation is where you have to say, okay, what policies do we want to see changed? How are we going to change them? And uh, what, ones, what battles can we win, what battle, battles can we you know, make progress on, and what battles are we just, just in the minority situation we just can't do. So in terms of glyphosate specifically, uh, we will be talking, of course, with, uh, with uh, whichever party is, is in government and uh, figuring out how we can, how we can push that envelope. Uh, but again, in minority situation, it's the give and the take. Uh, I can just tell you we'll do our best. Do you think Mr. Coon's going to stand with you on that? Because I know they're against it as well, the Green Party. Yeah. No, I, I, I believe he will. I, I don't have any question there. Um, but see, to have any bills passed, you have to have 25 votes. So even if us and, and the Greens did, you know, join together on that, you've only got six, six votes. So either Liberals or Conservatives have to go with that as well. And that's the challenge. Uh, now, I think uh, the PCs have called for a review on glyphosate spraying, which again, I think is a good step. At least, at least it's getting it on the scene to talk about it, uh, and we would support that if that's the direction that it went. That's great. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason, for calling in. <clears throat> and going back to some of the questions I have now, Premier uh, G Brian Gallant, he gets the first crack at forming government, uh, you know, popular vote and all that, um, but the math is tough obviously to work out in the end based on who's going to put up a fight here or there. Now, do you think Brian Gallant's going to uh, survive the throne speech? No. Yeah? No. Um, I, think, uh, I think we're down to the wire. I don't think. I know we are. Uh, Tuesday is the throne speech. Um, you know, and, and, and this is not personal in any way. I mean, we, we all fight hard for our opinions and our ideas. <laughs> excuse me, we get elected and we want to do what we said we're going to do. We want to continue to, do, you know, to fight for these things. And I'm sure Mr. Glant's no different. Uh, you know, he's had four years, uh, you know, in his thinking, he's done the best that he could. Um, but when, when, when the voters speak, the voters speak. And, uh, you know, again, Mr. Glant had the opportunity, and he has the opportunity, first crack at it, to get the majority vote. But I think at this stage of the game, he has to be realizing, and, and, and the Liberal Party has to be realizing that it's just not going to happen. So, you know, what he chooses to do next, I, I don't know. Um, the ball is, is still in his court until the throne speech comes down, and uh, we'll go from there. Now, at any point, was your party contacted by the Liberals to put someone up as Speaker of the House under a Gallant government? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Um, now, in the end, do you think Gallant might have an ace up his sleeve uh, to hold on to his power? I don't know what that ace would be. Um, <laughs> you know, like I said, we've declined, uh, all three of us, we've declined the Speaker's chair. 
Uh, all three Greens have, and I don't mean just verbally, I mean we've signed the document, we, we will not do this. Uh, the Greens have done that as have the PCs. So the Speaker has to come from the Liberal Party if there's going to be one at all, which again drops their numbers from 20 down to 20. So now they need, you know, uh, five extra people there to, to get the majority. So, um, you know, again, I, I, think, I think the time is up. And I think we, New Brunswickers want stability. They, they want a government. They don't want, they don't want this jockeying for power. I mean, I understand you can do that for a couple weeks after the election to try to get that majority. That's, that's fair. And I don't, I don't dismiss him for trying to do that. That's the way the system works. But we're beyond that now. Now it's time to, you know, you know concede that this isn't going to happen and, and gracefully step aside and allow, allow government to move forward. Right. Now, should Gallant's government fall, do you think, uh, do you think it will paint a picture of how other parties are, uh, are not willing to work with him to govern the province? Well, uh, I can only speak for us. Mm -hmm. And I can say that during the campaign and, and for the longest time, we've always said we'll work with any party that will work with us. Um, you know, and I think that's the way democracy is supposed to work. I fundamentally believe that. But when you have the leader of the Liberal Party basically saying on election night, we will not work with the People's Alliance, well then they have shut the door. And that's fine, I, I respect that, that's their choice. And I understand whatever perceptions are out there, that, that's, that's up to them. All I can say is we've always said we're going to work with other parties. Um, parties that say they're, they're not willing to work with us, then they've made their decision. And uh, we'll work with the parties that are willing to work with us. Now, do you think it would be disastrous to go back to the polls this quickly, even if it meant that your party <coughs> might gain a, one or two more seats? Mm -hmm. uh, nobody wants an election. Mm. I don't want an election. <clears throat> I, I can't find anybody uh, for the life of me <laughs> that wants another election. Look, we've done this. It would cost, I think, between eight, nine million dollars for this election, for any election, the provincial. Um, it's done. The, the votes have been cast. Um, it's time to put egos aside and your pride aside, and it's time to work, you know, on, on making New Brunswick a, a better place to live. Um, so, no, uh, nobody wants it. And I, and I did have the opportunity to meet with the Lieutenant Governor, governor on two occasions, and she has assured me as well that she does not want another election. So, I'm confident this is going to work. I, I, I don't think we're in a chaotic frenzy. I think. All we'll right. get stability. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for tonight. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Uh, thank you, Chris, for coming in with us tonight. Thank you. Um, so tonight we're talking about basically the four-party rumble in New Brunswick. Uh, thank you for watching. I'm your host, Troy Glover, and have a good night, everybody.